and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Ball podcast, where we are going heavier, boardier, with our good pal, Andrew Whitstep. Today we're going to talk about all sorts of shit, but before we do that, son, I need to talk to you guys about some things, okay? So, again, episode 100 is coming. I need you guys to send me questions. I want to hear your voice. So grab your little rectangles and go, uh, Matt, um, I want to know if, uh, okay. And then you hit the little square with the arrow going up and that's going to share it. That's going to send it to me. And you pick your email provider thing from the list that pops up. And then you just type in, I hate Matt Wall gmail.com in the subject line, put question for episode 100. Okay. You could ask as many or as few one as you want, okay? So get those to me because episode 100 is right around the corner. I think this is episode 90 or 91 or 92. Again, the last couple episodes, I made it clear that I have no idea how to count, okay? So get those to me and we will get this show on the road as quickly as humanly possible. So that's going to be awesome. Blood Shed Review Issue 2 is up now. Um, By the time you're hearing this, I think Drinking Less is going to be up. I know I've been um, teasing that for some time, um, but I did a live stream um, on YouTube with everybody yesterday where I individually made each cover extremely unique with its own wine stain. Um, So that was fun. And I even said Harvey Weinstein. Oh my fucking God. The things we do, people. The things we do. Pretty soon we're going to have an interview with Mindy Simmonson. We're going to have an interview with Dimitri Reyes. We're going to have an interview with Charlie Vaughn. And you might not know who Charlie Vaughn is right now, but you will once I'm through with him. Okay. And then we have a bunch of other stuff and I'm going to be doing a lot of reading poetry on my YouTube. So if you are on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to Matt Wall Poetry and Publishing. Just type in Matt Wall and look for the cute face with the busta over the top of it. You know, this guy. But if you saw that, that means you're already on YouTube. So how the fuck is this supposed to work? All right. So With that said, have you subscribed to Heavy Board yet? There's going to be a link down below. And if you haven't subscribed to Heavy Board yet, like we're going to have some words. So subscribe to Heavy Board. And now, without any further caca, on with the slow. You know, celebrities especially, they... And this is what Lerner gets into too. I think he misdiagnoses oh, it in yeah. his book, but it's there's a reverence, there is a sacredness built into particularly poetry, right? This is literally the oldest art form besides, you know, cave paintings. I guess technically drawing is the oldest. But even before we had written languages, you know, this was oral. This was people reciting memorized lines or a memorized story to a group of people sitting around a campfire or something. <clears throat> that was somebody's job, you know. And then when we have written languages, we can preserve it and things like that. But it's a it's a sacredness. It's 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 this old ancient art form that people want to be a part of. And I think celebrity artists, particularly so, you know, Franco, an actor or musicians mm-hmm. like Lana Del Rey or Jim Morrison, they want to participate in that kind of reverent kind of oldest art form, even if they don't do it well. Yeah. Right? Like you said, yeah. yeah, anything can be a poem. Sure, we can call these things poems, but it doesn't mean it's a good poem, right? There is, you know, good and bad things and judgment is important, but... There is but like you said, of... you said earlier, like there's like critically acclaimed books that you read and you're like, I don't fucking get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So where does like the objective and the subjective, like where did those meet and begin and shit? Oof, uh, it's an age old question. I'm <laughs> constantly trying to figure that out because yeah, it's both. Yeah. It yeah. is both. Like I, I could say that there's objective, clear and present standards of structure, of technique that we can point to and say, this is well done. This is what a good poem does. But then there's that, what we talked about earlier, right? That internal kind of reaction you have to a piece of art or a poem. And that counts for a lot too. So I I just, there's this constant balancing and I just, I guess I'm trying to just encourage people to be mindful of both 
because if, like I said at the beginning, if we go one way or the other with those, we start to lose what makes this thing so special or at least feel special. And like, I keep saying the word sacred, but like, I do treat it as kind of, I'm not a religious person, but it's like, and I don't like to substitute something like an art form for religion, but there is something to that. Like there's a mysticism around it. These things yeah. that make us feel things. So I can read a poem from somebody who's been dead hundreds, thousands of years, and I can feel what they mm -hmm. were trying to get me to feel yeah that's special you know like that and you know you see this with all a lot of different arts too paintings movies you know music you can listen to music from old times and feel that kind of wow that's powerful you know like yeah. it's, you feel something from it and uh it's always so hard to talk about that too i guess what i really try to do is is try my hardest to articulate that internal reaction to this stuff mm -hmm. but i mean as far as a definitive answer i don't know i mean it's and this is why we say it's subjective but because it is and it isn't right like there's i think this is what makes it so much fun to talk about i think this is what makes it so interesting i think it's what makes you know people like us do podcasts about it because we are constantly searching for why do i like this why don't i like this you know is it structural or is it just i don't like the taste you know i don't like his yeah. choice of words or that's kind of a corny image you know i don't know uh but I mean, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, interesting as hell. I, I'm, hopefully I'll dedicate my life to it, but. <laughs> we'll no, I, I totally agree with you there, Joan. And then I'm like thinking like, like, because you made some points about someone says stuff like this is a lesbian Latina poet. Now read their stuff. Yeah. Like, I can't remember the phrase you used for that, but is since a lot of how we appreciate art is how it makes us feel. Does that mean like knowing that stuff is more helpful in order to be touched by it if you fall into that category? Or is it like, because I think you guys were using the term limiting. Uh, Yeah. And I think this is what uh, I'm. If I'm remembering, I think that's the Carl Phillips, his uh, book of criticism, really, according to the realm where he talks about this. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, and I think he's probably correct about it. Yeah, there is this, you know, if that's the reason that you like something, that's fine. Perfectly valid reason to like somebody for identitarian reasons or, you know, it's trendy right now to do that, too. So, sure, you want to like that, fine. But it is, you know, if that's the only reason that mm -hmm. you like something it is kind of limiting oh, okay of, yeah okay like you need to have more there than just liking it because like like i like poets from la but that doesn't mean i'm gonna go buy lana del rey's book right yeah you know what i'm saying so yeah. like i i understand okay i get what you mean now okay. i mean it's you know it's just this over emphasis it's kind of a narrowing so if we're gonna like he does it phillips talks about it in terms of kind of the racial obsession we have now mm-hmm uh, where you do see people overpraising things that are just kind of okay or mediocre, but because they fit the right groups that are meant to be in the trend right now, I'm sure it'll be a different trend in 10 years, you know, but right now this is what it is. And it's just, yeah, I mean, is it good because it fits the trend right now or is it good because it's good, you know? I mean, I'm is saying. that more of a, like a white knighting thing that you're talking about? <laughs> or is it like a, cause like if, Let's say, well, this is one that I hear everyone bitch about every fucking five seconds. So Amanda Gorman. Okay. <laughs> so when a white guy starts talking about how important Amanda Gorman is, are you just like, oh, this fucking guy. And then, <laughs> but if like a black woman is like, oh my God, Amanda Gorman's so important. And here's why. Like, do you take that with like more? Oh, tell me more. Like, let me hear more about this. Like, do you like immediately turn off the white guy saying that? No, not necessarily. For me, I would turn off both just because if they're praising Amanda Gorman, you know, I would be like, oh, I probably don't want to listen to you. Uh, I think there is that, you know, it's something you have to yeah. grapple with now in the literary world and really everywhere now that you just yeah. have to grapple with the kind of obsession with identitarian politics and who's allowed to say what, when okay. uh, there are rules now, you know. And then people like us are like, why are there rules to the, what are you talking about? Like, you know, like, why are we, why are we putting rules on this? Like, why can't I say, you know, what I well, like or dislike or. You said something and I don't know enough about Carl Phillips to give a shit about this, but you said <laughs> that like, he's backed off on a lot of this stuff since, cause like, um, cause like this came out in 2004, um, Facebook came out in 2005 Twitter right. came out in 2007 and YouTube came out in 2006. 
So like he was like right before all this shit and he says all this stuff. So what has he walked back on? If you know, uh, he just doesn't like to talk about it. I wouldn't say he's walked it back necessarily. And I'm sure if you talk to him, if we were just getting a drink or something, he would be more than happy to talk about it. Honestly, I just think uh, particularly in the last seven years, you know, it was really, it was 2015 when everything kind of, this became the ultimate rule. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think he did it one, because if he didn't, if he did stand and constantly bring it up, there would be some ostracization of his reputation or his standing in the world. Uh, yeah. And he's very well respected and he's earned that, you know, uh, over many years of putting out really good poems. But, uh, yeah. you know, he's a Harvard trained guy so he views it kind of in the harold bloom sense whereas like you know it really doesn't matter what matters is one that reaction and uh -huh. then yeah the kind of subjective things we can point to structurally and things and say oh this is good or bad but then there's also that kind of just personal you know warm feeling you get out of yeah, uh, yeah. reading something you would love um but he walked back the kind of and the example he used in that book is the Langston Hughes poem, kind of the Black Arts Movement of the 1960s, which oh, is yeah, a very yeah. protest, protest heavy era mm. for good reason. We all know why. I mean, you yeah. know, very good reason for that. Uh, but then he's talking about looking back now, 50 years later, 60, 70 years later, like, uh, does it hold up? Right. Or is it too obsessed with the moment that it was created in? Kind well, of that's like, what I was going to hit you, you know? up with, too. Like, because, like, I mean, the wasteland. Like, how does that fall into this? Because that was a direct um, reaction to the war. So right. how how does that fit into that? Um, or is that so broad that it doesn't matter? Well, I guess everybody has their own opinions on uh, Elliot, but I guess the goal, right? And Bloom says this, Phillips says this, everybody who's trained in that same vein, because, you know, Phillips was probably trained by Helen Vendler over there at Harvard. And they would say that uh, the wasteland transcends that time period because it could be broadened out to something greater. It could yeah. be, you know, talked about a war now, uh, even you could read that. Um, I think Yeats war poems, the same thing. And then, you know, things that is it does it transcend the time it was written in or is it a period piece you know that was something we look back on preserved because it's part of the history but like is it really you know on the level of i don't want to say life-changing but just resonating with almost anybody that reads it you know or did yeah. you have to be there did you have to be in the moment and uh you see it now, you know, trends run in circles. We're kind of repeating the 1960s right now in some ways. In other ways, we're not because it's a different time, you know, yeah. but uh, artistically, and you're seeing some movement against this. You're seeing something so that, you know, they're always changing. The trends are always changing. So it's shifting one direction. It'll shift another direction in five years. And my goal is just to not be too captured by whatever's happening, you know? Yeah. And like, try to not... And I guess you the got, real you thing you gotta be you, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta, you gotta be exactly, you. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, do you like this thing because you like it, or do you like it because it ad adheres to what you're told to like, you know, kind yeah. of thing. And it's really hard right now because a lot of writers are taught if they want to be successful or make any money doing this, that you have to be up on trending topics. And if you can hit stuff that's trending, like you'll go viral. You know what I'm saying? So like that's kind of the double-edged sword there, I guess, for a lot the of kind people. of uh the Maggie Smith phenomenon and the mm -hmm. kind of uh yeah, if you go viral now, you can make your whole career made. I yeah. always tell people this, like mainly because I'm a Twitter addict, I'm addicted to it, but it's like Twitter is the world now. Like Instagram is the world now. If it happens yeah. on Instagram, even if it didn't happen in the real world, it will eventually be like memed into existence. Like it will For eventually real. happen. Yeah. So where it's like these weird, I mean, social media did, I don't know who's responsible for this or what. And, you know, blaming people is not always the best way to go about it, but uh, <laughs> it's just, I mean, how do you blame people for a cultural milieu? You know, yeah. these, these, devices were invented these addiction software social media were invented and now it's just the whole world runs through those and, and five of, years from now we're yeah. going to be like talking about how ai has destroyed everything that yeah. we care about. <laughs> yeah. 
it's interesting with that too the ai there i mean it's like every it, week there's something new that's yeah. like crazy and it's just like how did that already get that much better in like a week dude oh it's fucking crazy like what you were saying about elliot like you might know this i i'm not aware when the wasteland came out did it like the average public know that it was in response to the war i don't know enough i the average public i would assume no um just because the average public i assume wasn't reading like well like the average stuff, but the average person poetry. who was reading poetry at the time uh probably because that okay. was a huge deal I mean, yeah. you know, the world wars were a pretty big deal yeah. to everybody uh, that lived through them. You saw all the modernist writers, they all had to write a war book because yeah. they were all drafted to go over there. Oh, and, like, yeah, they had to get shot at. I just, I don't no know, because um, I know how Elliot, like, like, specifically tried to confuse people with what was going on so i didn't know if in his um because i've never read the stuff that he wrote that was trying to fuck people around like that so i don't know if like he was like oh no this is really about just like eating bacon you know like yeah and modernist i guess modernists have that reputation for purposely overcomplicating things to one is part of like kind of an intellectual game i think mm -hmm. and then also part of trying to push the art form you know how many meanings can you get into this one sentence kind of thing and then they all could possibly work right like that's technique that's that's skill you know you have to develop that that's yeah 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 and if everybody's trying to do that, well, then everybody's going to, you know, competition does matter in a certain sense for, yeah, do it for yourself, do your own thing. But, you know, you are all human. You can't help but looking at the person next to you who just put out a book being like, that's pretty good. I got to step up my game. You know, like that's, mm -hmm. that's, you know, uh, there is something to that. And then there's something to just wanting to fuck with people. I think, you know, this is the beats I think would do that yeah, too. For in real. Their ray. They would try to purposely obscure or describe things in a way that made them unusual or new. Yeah. Yeah. But um, on a completely other note, I just remembered something. Um, you guys were talking about um, the trees, the trees. And you were oh, like, yeah. I, I don't know why this book is called The Trees, The Trees. There's barely any trees in it. <laughs> and I was thinking about it and I'm like, I wonder if she was like hitting the whole thing. Like, I can't see the forest through the trees. And like each one of my poems is a tree, but I can't see the collection through it because of all of the like. And I'm just like, wow, that's so I, I made up a whole idea of why the book's called that. And then I'm like, oh, what an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well. I think this is the reason I, I avoid writers kind of after the fact rationalizations. Cause like, you know, when you're writing something and you know this, and I know a lot of listeners probably know this too, you know, you don't really know why the fuck you did something, right? Like it was just kind of a subconscious thing mm -hmm. that happened. You're like, oh, I kind of like that, you know? And then people keep asking you about it in interviews and things, especially if you're a big name and you start to kind of create these rationalizations as to why it happened. Yeah. So that's why I try to not give so much credit even to what the writer said it was supposed to be uh, because a lot of times we do that after the fact. We just did you ever rationalize. find out why she called it that? Like, did you ever look into it? Uh, Oh no, no, no. Actually for that book, it was, that was the first book. I think that I was, we recorded that I was in a terrible mood <laughs> and uh, I didn't pick that book. I think uh, my co my former co-host put that on the list. Yeah. And I think she was recommended it by a friend. So she hadn't read it either. And we were just, yeah, you know, we're putting the list together. Let's let's read it. You know, everything goes. Fair yeah. game. I, I'll read anything, you know, I'll read it and, and engage with it. And that was when I just kind of got started going on rants about Instagram poetry <laughs> and like how bad it is. And but it is the thing that everybody, if people are consuming poetry now, they're probably consuming the Instagram poetry. Yeah. And there's a lament about that, but oh yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I have my feelings on that, but what can I do about it? <laughs> I guess just mm. podcast to save the world. From... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's, <laughs> to save the world. <laughs> That's awesome. What got you into poetry? Well, the like, I mean, if we aren't talking about like Shel Silverstein and Dr. Seuss, I would say the first like real poetry that I got was Edgar Allan Poe. Like, 
Edgar Allan Poe is the only person who was like really taught in the school I went to, like the schools I've been to, that was like the constant, like no matter what, like <laughs> elementary school, junior high, yeah. high school, college, it was like Edgar Allan Poe is what you're fucking going to learn. You know, Annabelle we're going to go over this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that was like kind of my first like love. I remember when the Doors movie came out, um, I got Jim Morrison's Wilderness. And I remember there was one poem in there that I really liked that I read over and over again, but I can't remember what it is. And I don't remember anything else about the book. And when uh, I, this like junior high age, like I was like telling my family, like I'm really into poetry now, like I'm really digging this. And so like, um, I got like a Robert Frost collection and like a Longfellow collection and, um, just a bunch of other more like pre them like classical stuff and it was okay i i didn't like go over the moon about it but the iliad was a huge thing in school for me and then um Caterbury tales like i loved that and um then tried to get into milton and um all that shit then i think like and like I get annoyed when people say stuff like this, but it makes total sense. But like, then the poets that really spoke to me were like, um, punk bands, you know, like I got into black flag and it was like my whole fucking world turned upside down. Right. And, um, Nirvana came out and I got into that. I, I just felt like those words were being spoken to me instead of me having to consume someone else's words is the best way to say it and because i was in a band after i became an adult and everything and that was like my life like right there wasn't a whole lot of poetry in my life until i sat down and just like for a minute and was just like okay and then like just in reading like that's how everything fell back into it yeah i love that i love that i like the same thing i mean it's funny like even in my mfa like the venn diagram of people that are interested in writing or poetry and then the people that were in bands you know in teen years into the yeah. early adulthood very big you know almost a circle for a lot oh of these for sure of artsy yeah. artsy people right we're in that scene you know you're getting tattoos you're you're listening to this music that your parents hate or or not even punk not that many people like it until like the 90s when it kind of went that green yeah. day style blink 182 mainstream with a poppier element to it you know oh, for uh, real yeah and i'm an you know i'm a millennial so i fucking love green day and all that uh, i'm a harry potter guy you know <laughs> but yeah for same yeah. for me like it was music it was music i'd never read a fucking poetry book apart from like you know being taught the shit you get taught in school and i hated it you know didn't mm-hmm. care didn't even know how to read it and then it was like these lyricists, these, these, yeah, Kurt Cobain. I mean, if you just read some of those lyrics that Kurt Cobain wrote, fucking incredible, like mm-hmm. incredible images. Like, yeah, he was definitely reading poetry. <laughs> like he was reading those and like, it's, he was by. reading the poetry for me. <laughs> for yeah, sure. yeah. Really into the indie rock scene when I yeah. was in college and like modest mouse, still one of my mm-hmm. favorite bands, Isaac Brock's lyrics, I think he's one of the best in the business at writing lyrics, even though their last couple albums were a little fallen off, but like, you know, that run they had, you know, in the late nineties, early two thousands, every fucking song he's having poetry in there. Mm -hmm. And then you get into college and you're just kind of like Bukowski, that you can do this, you know, that this can be poetry. And then you just kind of starts to snowball, you know, into one thing after the other. I love it. I love hearing when people get into poetry through music because they're they're different things but they're not unrelated you know there's yeah. overlap you're for real reciting a, a rehearsed kind of carefully art carefully placed list of words in this order specific order to give people that feeling that yeah that, that meaning behind it i think a lot of it too is the length like can you convey x amount of motion in x amount of time right you know yeah, yeah, um, yeah. that and that was like kind of a big thing for me for sure you know um because as far as like 
like literary influences go like i like around the same time when i'm like listening to a bunch of punk and i'm like listening to nirvana and the whole fucking thing um is when i picked up naked lunch because that movie was going to come out soon right and um i picked that book up and completely blew my mind because like i had just never seen anything like that before and like i couldn't believe the words i was looking at and i felt like i was doing something bad like i was like is anyone watching me like should like i'd be looking over my shoulder when i'm reading this you know some of those images i know i'll never forget some of those oh my fucking god dude. the whorehouse descriptions like, yeah yeah just like just, you can put that in a book oh, like yeah you know? for real like, and yeah. then like honestly like later in life when i found out uh, like oh yeah this book up i said for obscenity it's like yeah no fucking shit dude <laughs> like <laughs> of course it did especially but, in um, the 50s yeah, yeah no shit <laughs> and I, but like that blew my mind and then fear and loathing in las vegas um blew my mind and um but breakfast of champions breakfast of oh, champions yes. was the book like i got fucking the butthole tattoo on my finger wow. there. um <laughs> <laughs> but um like breakfast of champions fucked me in a way that like nothing ever had before and i think a lot of it had to do with like the satire is amazing but how simple it's like hey i'm gonna talk to you like you're from another fucking planet and you're a complete right. fucking idiot and you don't know what the fuck i'm talking about and i'm gonna fucking t tell you some very complicated shit yeah. in a fucking very childlike way right you yeah. dumb fuck listen to me this is how it is and i just like i i don't know dude like i felt like vonnegut was like my grandpa for a long time you know I'm like, glad you brought it up i love vonnegut he's oh, literally my, if i had to pick God. favorite writers vonnegut is the reason i wanted to be a writer exactly champions is my favorite it's oh my best. god dude it's thanks best. Yeah. Like most people won't say Breakfast of Champions. And I'm like, no, dude, Breakfast of Champions is better than Slaughterhouse Five. Shut yeah. your fucking mouth. Listen I'll say up. it too. Yeah. <laughs> but I would also say Breakfast of Champions, the funniest novel ever written. Oh, it's like show, show, Yeah. Show me a funnier book than this. Like, is this funnier? Like, even like the ones that were known for humor, you know, like, yeah. like Dickens had some funny jokes in his, but like, it's not as funny as Vonnegut. Like, no. And that's the funny Vonnegut's thing too, because like yeah. people will say like, oh dude, you got to read this book. It's hysterical. I'm like, oh, have you read Breakfast of Champions? <laughs> and I'll give him Breakfast of Champions. And like, sometimes it hits, sometimes it doesn't. But Breakfast right. of Champions is the one book that I bought more than any other book because I would read a copy of it and beat the shit out of it, read it all the fucking time and then give it to somebody and then never right. get it back. And so like, I'm like, okay, well I'm off to get another copy of this. Right. But yeah. like, that was like my catcher in the rye, you know, that was the thing. Like I took with me everywhere I went, you know, back when people would carry a book with them everywhere they fucking went, you know, it, it's yeah. just like, you could open it up to any passage and just start reading and fucking completely no matter how many times you read it just be entertained and like learn something you know like every time i read that book i feel like a dumbass you know there's <laughs> always something i'm like i've read this book how many times and i'm just hearing this now like what the fuck is it? oh but yeah so that got me on a huge want to get kicked but that got me into writing and wanting to fucking right. create and shit but like I mean, I've gone through everything now, but um, for the longest time, it was like Breakfast of Champions, Slapstick, Sirens of Titan. Yeah, Sirens um, of Titan, gotta have that in there. Yeah, yeah. dude. Um, and then I think Mother Night was my least favorite. Um, uh, Cat's Cradle in there? Cat's Cradle. Oh yeah, Cat's Cradle, yeah, 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 for real. And then um, there is like Player Piano, I didn't think was a great book, but there's one chapter in Cat's Cradle that just um, brought me to tears. I'm trying to yeah. remember what it was. It was, um, I think it was, there was a family and it has that same kind of thing from Welcome to the Monkey House where people have to like put stuff on them. Right, right, right. Yeah, to, yeah. To, to like, I can't remember. Dude, and like, do you think about like what Vonnegut would think right now? Oh, he would be eviscerating. He would be like, writing columns in the new yorker that eviscerate everybody and like talk about how ridiculous everyone's being oh my fucking god yeah. dude oh. and just like 
Breakfast of Champions, like one of the simple things that I think just works and only Vonnegut could get away with this. Like if I tried to do it, it wouldn't work. All these other writers tried to do it. It wouldn't work. Yeah. Every character's penis size is mentioned. I was like good. every character. <laughs> like every single character is like his penis is this large you never can tell you know like whose penis gets large and who is a small like, oh kind of, my fucking god that's and it's so just, good it is just a constant very simple reoccur almost like you said childlike like this is locker room like kind of like uh simple and, easy joke but it works and, and this is a wide open time. beaver yeah. you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> And, but it's funny because like he does those things with things that we think are silly, like penis size, right. what a beaver is. And then he's like, and this is a Nazi flag. Right. This is what it looked like. Yeah. And so like, and this is a gun and it can like make someone not live anymore. And here's why. And like, but it's like those things wouldn't have worked on that level if he didn't do the little things in the beginning. Yeah. You know, it's just like it's fucking brilliant, dude. It's such a fucking good book, man. Edgar Allan Poe, like back to that. Like, yeah. I thought all poetry had to be gothic. Like, I'm like, oh, that's what poetry is. So it's, it, you know, this is what it is. It's got to be like really sad. Some chick's dead. You're really upset about it. You might have been the one that killed her. Who fucking knows? Who cares? You probably have syphilis. Let's like just keep going with this, right? <laughs> so then I started like trying to find like probably like 18 ish. I'm trying to find every gothic book that I could find to try to get the same feel. And because I'm going to like, there's no internet, I can't figure this shit out. I have to just like dig. I start going to all these used bookstores that have gothic sections, and the gothic section at a used bookstore are romance novels from the 60s <laughs> and I, so i buy all these books i'm like what the fuck is this like this is so that um that pretty much took me out of that and then because i'm um a big pulp fan like weird fiction fan oh hell yeah like um like clark ashton smith and hp lovecraft and are you a are you a ross Howard. mcdonald fan um yeah but i think other people did it better yeah, I'm you know, a huge Ross, Ross like, McDonald guy. Like, do you like um Raymond Chandler at all? Oh yeah, yeah, I've read like, all his. Like with Ross Lady McDonald, in the Lake. Yeah. Lady in the Lake, dude. It's his my best favorite. one in my yeah, it's his oh, best one. Yeah. Go. This fucking guy. <laughs> this fucking guy, dude. Oh shit. Do you know how many fucking arguments I've gotten into over fucking um uh, people saying the well, big sleep or fucking um the long the goodbye? Big sleep. Uh, the big sleep and the long goodbye get a lot of reputation because the oh. movies that were made from and they're so not like they're, even good, right? Yeah, those yeah, movies yeah. are really fucking bad, dude. Even the long goodbye it gets overpraised by like LA people because it's oh. about LA, you know, oh, like he was it, the dude. LA crime writer. You know? Yeah, no, dude, fucking Lady in the yeah. Lake, and that's the crazy thing too, because like a lot of the Lady in the Lake bits um, are about like Big Bear, like where I lived when I was up in the mountain, and so like like running springs is a name of a town coming up the road and and that book he called it like babbling something you know like everything had like a weird different little name but then he would say like i crossed the dam and i'm like oh i know where that is and then he would like say something else i'm like oh i know where that is and so i'm like going through my town trying to find all this shit but no lady in the lake is fucking amazing that is such a fucking good book but oh yeah like so i i prefer um like philip marlowe to like lou archer you know what i'm saying lou archer is a little <clears throat> his moral backbone i can see is why people go to uh uh the philip marlowe more than lou archer because lou uh -huh. archer has a little bit more morality to him okay he's not willing to do certain sleazy things you know like yeah, he doesn't yeah, want to yeah. sleep with the girl even though he does sometimes you know so maybe that it's not as kind of gritty and it's a little later, you know, Chandler was kind of before yeah. McDonald and all those guys. But what you said about the depressing aspect in like the Gothic style that you were introduced to with, with Poe mm. and all that funny story. Uh, when I was teaching, I was really, I was assisting as a grad student, my mentor, uh, one of her undergrad poetry workshops in grad school. And, you know, it was probably like 15 undergrad kids that had all varying degrees. Some were just taking it because, you know, it's a class. Some were taking it because they actually were curious. Some actually mm -hmm. had some background and loved poetry already. 
but there was a reading by uh you know a visiting writer rodney jones the poet was the was the visiting writer he's great he actually i had a great chance to talk with him very cool guy and he had a lot of nice things to say about my work but he uh gave a reading and then i had my i had the students come i was like you know if you go to this reading tonight on campus you bring me a one-page reflection on it you know and you get extra credit or whatever yeah not everyone did but a couple of them did And this one girl she's you know a little southern cajun girl that lived in that small town her whole life she uh wrote this great essay about it where she was just like you know every time i go to a poetry reading she's like why is it so depressing like <laughs> why is it always so sad like isn't anybody happy <laughs> like, can anybody write like some positive fucking poems and I gave her, I was, I gave her extra points for that. I was just like, this is one of the best observations I've seen an undergrad make like about this, like, good for you. <laughs> it's so true. Like there's, yeah. and there is this, like, even like you get the poets lives, writers lives, we romanticize mm -hmm. them into oblivion. We romanticize yeah. the drug use. We romanticize the kind of being a shitty person, uh, and that's always kind of after the fact too, right? Like Edgar Allan yeah. Poe, like, was he a great guy? No, this guy no. was addicted to opium. Yeah. Like this guy was, you know, and really his short stories are better than most of his poems, you know? Uh, oh yeah, dude. But, and then all those pulp guys, the other thing about those pulp guys, they took it very seriously. Yeah. You know, Stephen King gets a lot of shit and I'll always defend Stephen King in certain places because he takes it seriously, even though he's a little corny, he's got a little mm -hmm. dad joke stuff to him, you know, take it seriously. Like these guys, you could tell they loved Hemingway, like Chandler's stuff is so clean. McDonald's yeah. stuff is so clean. There's not like little extra flourishes. There's not like indulgent little personal things that they felt they had to include. Like there were just... And if you read some of those letters, like these guys were fucking competitive. Like they oh, were fuck like, yeah, dude. Like McDonald like hated I, being compared to Chandler. Like he wrote essays to like the Atlantic, being like, "Stop comparing me to Chandler." <laughs> like kind yeah. of like just kind of. That's the greatest thing is back in the day when the only communication people had, like the closest thing to social media, was the letter section in a magazine. Right. <laughs> like, and you just see these motherfuckers, like, like because the people who write in the fucking magazines and shit would send letters in like talking shit on other people who wrote fucking shit and like Lovecraft and Howard would go back and forth and fucking weird tales before they started um, corresponding. And I don't know if you've read this, but like their letters um, going back and forth with um, civilization versus barbarism is like one of the most fucking amazing, like, correspondence that you could ever fucking imagine it's just like they're like just gutting each other you know and like right. there was a mutual respect but right like, yeah yeah they all these motherfuckers took it seriously as shit you know Hemingway, and, yeah and the famously would get pissed at bad reviews and stuff and be writing angry letters to the yeah. reviewers and the papers and... see that uh, the, i don't know where i stand on that because like when I hear like, oh, somebody didn't like my review because that just like makes me think of like when people get on Goodreads, like, and they're like, oh, this book was crap, and then the author's like, how oh, fucking dare you, sir? Yeah. <laughs> like, where's your book and all this other shit? It's just it's hysterical, but like, um, I don't know, dude. Like, it does come off. It's hard for it not to come off as sour grapes, you know, oh, for real. When yeah. somebody's criticizing your work, if you want to be a professional artist, you just have to accept it you know like people yeah. are going to criticize it and hopefully some people praise it too but you know mm -hmm. it's not a guarantee and it just usually if you try to be ah, well, you, you, what was it recently there was a goodreads blow up and i'm not on goodreads i don't fuck with it it's just another thing that i'm like i don't yeah i just walked that, away but... from that a while ago yeah because there's a blow up every fucking week on this stuff and it's like somebody it's always about somebody said somebody said it's like i don't care what these like, like these people said like you yeah. can post whatever you want on this website like the author responding just is always a bad look. Like it's like, it's like, um, it's like when you're a professional sports player, right? Like, or something, people are shouting shit at you from the stands. Like yeah. you suck, you know, like you can't hit that kind of thing. For Baseball real. stadiums. It's probably the best because you can actually hear it. <laughs> yeah. And like the players can actually turn around and they like, hear you like, but like, they can't react. Like they, if they react, it looks worse on them. And it For sounds real. like, dude, you're a famous player. You're getting paid millions to play. Like if you can't handle people shouting shit at you, from the stand you know what the hell are you doing yeah like, and that's why twitter cracks me up like twitter oh. is like a fucking shit storm of that crap 
you know, like, <laughs> and, but the funny thing is it's like a car crash. So everyone's going to go look at it and like, but that's when I'm just like, where, where do you stop? Right. You know, like, when do you say like, it's like going back to what you were talking about, about like identity shit, like there are some people when you like criticize their work, like they'll just call you a uh, something for right. thinking that in the first place. Like, not that you could have had a clear thought of what you thought about somebody's work, right. but that now you are a somethingist for right. like saying that. That you're not talking about the work, you're talking about the person, right? Exactly. And it's like this conspiracy theory that you hold these deeply held beliefs or something that you're yeah. like keeping secret and nobody, you know. And yeah, it's usually, I mean, it's because the identitarian stuff, it's taken over the entire field. Like there is no way, especially if you go into the academy, it's worse in the academy than it is in kind of the circles of like, you know, the DIY guys online, like us yeah. doing our stuff. Like it's definitely worse there, but you know, it's everywhere. And there is, I call it conspiracy because it is like, it's this kind of conspiracy of like, you can't just not like it. There has to be like a deep seated reason, like some ism inside you that is making you not like it. Like it's yeah. just, and it, that's why I say like, it is narrowing, like it narrows the scope. And now I think it's a disservice to the author too, because we're trying to engage fairly with the work. And then if we're saying, oh, anybody who doesn't like this is, you know, whatever, a racist or something, that's the reason you don't like it. Yeah, It's like, well, you're insulting the author too, kind of secondhand by saying that people aren't going to engage with his work fairly or their work fairly, you know, like, and it does, it just, it's a, it's a cloud over everything right now. And I think it makes people very afraid it makes the art suck. It makes the kind of self-censoring that we're seeing everywhere and not even self-censoring, but like publishers will cut out certain things of your book, certain descriptions, because they're worried about that. Those, those accusations flying around is like, well, only a horrible person could think up this thing. And then it gets back to like, you know, we don't, when you're creating something, there's not necessarily a rhyme or reason for it, right? Like you just kind of do it because it feels right in the moment. And then. Do you think that clouds the judgment of who publishers are actually putting out? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Like, do they want to put out somebody who is above reproach in that sense? Or do they want to put somebody out who can have fair, like reviews about them? Um. I think reviews in like the big five presses that are putting out the books that, you know, everybody wants, everybody wants to deal with one of the big five presses, uh, you know, the New York publishing houses that are the yeah. big, big five, big four now, although I guess they, the government shut down that deal with Simon and Schuster and random house, but, uh, Oh, so that's not happening now. As of right now, it's on hold. I'm assuming it's going to be lobbied into existence, but yeah. the government is saying that it's monopolizing and too big. But, you know, there's ways around that. And I'm sure mm -hmm. that they have an army of lawyers that are going to get around Fuck that. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, because they want to consolidate because they're trying to milk the profits. And that's understandable from their perspective. I think, you know, they follow the trends. They're trend chasers. So they're not necessarily setting the trend or even if it's not like, I don't think it's like a conscious thing where people are trying to be like, oh, we can only put out this type of thing or this type of writer or this type of work. I think, you know, I, they're clearly well-intentioned. They're trying to uh, do good in the world, I think is their motivation for obsessing over stuff like this, the kind yeah. of identitarian stuff. And there's that aspect of, they think they're making up for past atrocities kind of thing, uh, past exclusion. Uh, which is very real. Everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> you just have to read a history book and you know. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's it clouds their judgment for sure because they're obsessed with getting a particular type. That's an interesting thing too, where it's part of this, where like now it doesn't matter what you write. You're forced to take a position on something other than the writing, you know? Yeah. And they like, they kind of force writers to do this in a way where it's like well yeah you wrote a book that doesn't have anything to do with this necessarily but where do you stand on this hot button political issue you know uh, well i mean that's how a lot of fucking articles are being written right now like yeah. i just i did a episode the last episode i did like it was supposed to be about um poetry has lost its violence and how censorous assholes are 
doing all this stuff. And the article had nothing to fucking do with any of that. It was just like, here's our clickbaity fucking title. Right. So yeah. like here, uh, like they gave up even trying to find people to write the shit that they wanted to have in the fucking magazine in the first place. And now it's just like, we will put, take any mundane fucking milk toast fucking article and put it on here and then say, I don't know, woke. I would say they use like chat GPT to get those articles or whatever. <laughs> they just like write them out with like a clickbait headline. And they're like, yeah, read it. And people uh. click it. And that is where the podcast vasectomy will happen. Okay. I snipped it there. We cut. Okay. And in about another episode or so, you'll hear the finale of this epic conversation I had with Andrew Whitset. So again, go give Heavy Board a sub on Instagram, on probably Twitter. I don't know if they're on Twitter. And on YouTube. Okay. And then you can run over to Patreon if you want to support them even harder. Okay. Um, and then as far as the thank yous, we have a bunch of new thank yous to do. So let's just fucking get into this. So here we go. Let's do some fucking shout outs. I want to give a big thank you to all you motherfuckers over there on Patreon. I want to give thank you to Michael, to Cedar, to Harry, to Monse. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. And then over there in the YouTube thank you crew, I want to give a big thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to Jan, to Deb, to Ethan, to Julia, to our newest members, Lauren and Jason. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. Um, and then over in the Anarchy crew, I want to give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Minnie, to Thomas, to Tim J, to Shaylin, to Tim G, to Chill Baby, to Tamara, to Adam, to Chase, to JH, and to Jessica. Thank you so much. And then for the burgers of the motherfucking thank yous, that goes over to the number one chappy in the chat book of the month club. Let's hear it for Caitlin. Thank you so much. You are awesome. And I heart you. Okay. So thank you for that. So everyone who's new um, over on Patreon too, Monse, thank you so much. Um, and the new folks in the thank you crew, you guys are the shit. So thank you guys. And if there's anything I can do for you, be sure to let me know, and I will do my darndest to make you smile, okay? So, with all that said, run over to Etsy, check out all the stuff, keep buying our books, support Poetic Anarchy, type hard, everybody, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon, I appreciate the hell out of you guys, and thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.